Hi, I'm Carl Ferre. I'm president of the Georgia Cell and Macrobiotic Foundation and editor of Macrobiotics Today. And today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is acid and alkaline. Um, something I learned from Herman Ihara when I worked with him um, years ago. Uh, and so I'm going to start with a um, PowerPoint presentation. If I can get there. Okay, so let's see if I click that. Okay, so here we're talking about practical alkalinity um, based on Herman Ihara's book, Acid and Alkaline, and my book that I wrote as a companion to that book. So acid and alkaline theory um, started in the 1920s and 30s by William Howard Hay. Uh, doctor in those days. It was popularized by Herman Ihara in the 70s and 80s and um, in the 90s and 2000 was expanded by many other authors. Now that we have a true al acid alkaline theory, I'm going to distinguish between true theory and a modern theory which is um, not true in my opinion. Anyway, the true acid alkaline theory is the optimum diet for health is more alkaline forming foods than acid forming foods. Prolonged eating of excess acid forming foods lead to many disorders. And that most disorders, including cancers, thrive in an acidic internal environment. This is a true acid alkaline theory. Now, in my experience, what I've found is I received many calls, especially in the early days when we were still getting phone calls and not all using social media and, and chatting, um, you know, and emails. But many people would call after three years of macrobiotic practice and they had fatigue and dull mental awareness. And they often felt like they needed animal foods because that's why they had lower energy. So I would reason with them that the possible reasons for their fatigue was too much emphasis on grains it, to the exclusion of vegetables, not enough sea salt and related products, and no sea vegetables in their diet. So um, there's greater concern in modern times because the proliferation of chemicals on crops, increased smog and poor air quality, more additives to water sources, aerial spraying of chemicals, and climate changes leading to catastrophic events. We all know them from floods to fires, earthquakes and, and hurricanes. So I wanna look first at environmental effects and what are alkaline forming and what are acid forming. So the alkaline forming ones are relaxation, meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, and deep breathing, especially breathing out. The acidifying ones are polluted air, cell towers, lack of sleep, accidents, stress at home or work, or negative emotions. So obviously if you can reduce this acidifying ones, as much as you can and practice the alkaline ones more, it's good for you. Um, now there's newer alkaline diets that I mentioned earlier. And these promise miracle cures with an 80-20 diet. That means 80% alkaline forming foods and 20% acid forming foods. So they use scare tactics and misguided statements to sell expensive items. These are not recommended by dietitians and not recommended by me either, except in extreme uh, situations. Um, and these have increased as the typical American diet and environment has become more acid forming. So as more people eat red meat and sugar, um, the, which is very acid forming and the environment's becoming more acid forming. Uh, and there's more stress because of COVID and everything else. Um, everything's more acid forming. So that would mean eating more alkaline forming foods. So there's a common misconception that there are studies that prove or disprove acid alkaline theory. There aren't any studies 
that prove directly acid and alkaline theory. But there is common agreement between <clears throat> acid and alkaline theorists and medicine. And that is they've shown test tube studies on cancer growth have shown that acidic environment um, increases cancer growth. Osteoporosis is linked with acidic diets and we'll get into that a little bit later. And that a near neutral pH is best for everyone. So those are the common agreements that we have. So look at the chemistry. <clears throat> so without water and ionization, we can't live. Basically, hydrogen has one proton and one electron, as we can see here. We all learned this in chemistry, right? The proton in the middle, the electron, the proton's positive, the electron's negative. And what happens is water dissociates. Uh, that means that one of the hydrogen leaves and becomes an H plus, because remember it's a positive charge. That's a proton, proton proton donor, which is an acid and is written as H3C uh, of H. Uh, it's a hydronium acid, you can read it. Um, basically, it's because it's in water. It's an H plus in water gives you hydronium. And it also, the other part of that is the OH, and that's the proton acceptor. It's an alkaline and it's written as HCO3 minus, which is bicarbonate. It's a byproduct of the body's metabolism. It's regulated by the lungs and the kidneys. So here's a picture of it. You have the dissociation and what happens. You get a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion. Now, important thing to know, water associates faster than it dissociates. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit too. So um, you can dissociate, you can use a mechanical process to dissociate water, but it will associate back very fast. So Gennad, you had your hand up? No. no just... Okay, so we have a pH. Have a pH. Yeah, so the pH scale um, is a log rhythmic measure of acidity and alkalinity in any solution. So on all foods and substances can be measured for acidity and alkalinity. And here's the best chart I could find. If there's more of the acid side, the H plus, you're going to have an acidic. It's going to be acidic and it's alkaline if there's more OH minus. So they just measure that. The pH range, uh, the practical range of pH is minus 1.2 to 15.0. There have been some things that have been found more negative than pH 1.2. But the reason for this is the log, it's a logarithmic. Um, I don't want to get too much into the math, but it's a, it's a logarithmic scale. Um, so a lot of people say the scale is from zero to 14. Uh, that's not ac actually accurate, but for all practical purposes, it's okay. Um, so it's logarithmic meaning, um, so I break it down for you here. The pH 6.0 is 10 times more acidic than 7.0. pH 5.0 is 100 times more acidic than 7.0. 7.0 is neutral, by the way. And pH 4.0 is 1,000 times, pH 3 is 10,000 times, pH 2 is 100 times more acidic than neutral. The stomach pH is about 2.0. So that's why I point this out. It's about 100,000 times more acidic than, um, than neutral. Um, so there's several reasons I'm pointing this out, but I'm gonna give you the pH of some body fluids. So saliva, a healthy saliva is a 6.5 to 7.4. The stomach juice is 1.7 to 2.0. The small intestines are around 6.0. So you might ask, how do we get 
the contents of the stomach go into the small intestines and how do they raise from 2.0 to 6.0? So that would be an obvious question. Well, the first thing is you have bile coming in from the liver, which is very alkaline forming, and you have pancreatic juice coming from the pancreas, which is also alkaline forming. So that raises the pH in the small intestines. Um, urine pH can go anywhere from 4.5 to 8.0. This is normally um, depending on what your body's getting rid of. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about the effects of ash. When we talk about foods, the food comes into the small intestines from the stomach, and we call this the ash of the food, what's left after it gets um, through the stomach and comes into the small intestines. So if you have alkaline ash, this is going to increase alkalinity and buffer acids. If you have weak acid ash, it's either acidic or al alkaline, and it's processed by the lungs. And if you have strong acid ash, it increases acidity and it's processed by the kidneys. Um, so I don't know if I did a slide on what we, a weak ash is, but uh, um, I'll explain that in a minute. So normal pH range of the blood, let's talk about blood pH, is 7.35 uh, to uh, 7.45. So you see that's slightly alkaline. And it's critical that this range be maintained. Anything below the 7.35 indicates acidosis. If it's above 7.45, it indicates alkalosis. So this is more a medical condition um, and you may need more than just food to take care of it if you're in one of those situations. A pH below 6.9 is fatal because the heart relaxes and a pH above 7.8 is fa fatal because the heart contracts. So another misconception that dietary changes affect blood pH. They don't. Okay, true acid and alkaline theory never said this, but because this misconception has been the newer alkaline, acid alkaline theorists are saying this, doctors use this assertion to debunk all acid alkaline theory. So um, as I say, they leave a mistaken impression. So let's look at the buffer system that the body has. We all have a buffer system, which is huge, strong, and immediate. Um, buffering of mixed acids by bar bio bicarbonate changes um, to, as you can see, an alkaline plus CO2, what we breathe out. So you're just breathing it out all the time. That's why when you breathe, out more than breathing in, you put more emphasis on the breathing out, you're alkalizing yourself. So this is um, respiratory, uh, we just talked about that, or renal alteration in how much you're excreting out of the kidneys. So um, the point is that the blood pH is maintained in the normal range at all times. Um, I could explain um, later. Maybe remind me if there's time, I'll tell you about the Swan Pitts experiment because it's, it's interesting related right to that. So let's look at meta metabolic waste. I wanna make sure I preface this. These are metabolic waste. 70% comes out of the lungs you process. So when you think of your metabolic race, most people don't realize that 70% comes out the lungs, 20% comes out the skin, which in macrobiotics we know is controlled by what? The kidneys. So 7% comes out with the urine and it leaves only 3% through the bowels. So um, I meant to ask people to guess which one, how, where the metabolic waste go, but I just told you so. Um, 
you don't get to guess this time. Um, so problems of excess acidity is the loss of alkaline minerals that are borrowed from tissues and organs. So if your body is getting a lot of acids all the time, it needs more alkalines to process it. And if you're not putting it in as food, it's gonna look around and go, where can I get some alkaline minerals? And as we'll see in a minute, calcium is an alkaline mineral. It's in the bones. So there's a conversion factor that has to take place here to get the, the, the type of calcium that's in the bone is different. You've got to um, change the structure. But anyway, uh, that's why osteoporosis shows up as uh, an effect of too much acidity. So you also have end enzyme disruption, which results in fatigue and dull mental awareness, which we mentioned earlier. You also have caustic damage due to excess acidity. I remember one time we, uh, we our battery went out um, and um, I, so I rode my bicycle to the store to get a new battery and I had the old one in the back of the, um, we had one of those baby carriers. Um, and so I put it in the, in the trailer, in the baby carrier seat, and some of the acid leaked. And of course it just ate through the bottom of the thing and the, and the battery fell on the pavement. And so I learned very quickly how much acidity can eat through things. So, but again, I wanna make the point the blood pH is maintained. So let's look at the acid alkaline minerals because this is what's most important to us and what we want, <clears throat> we want to see. So first is alkaline forming are sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and iron. The acid forming ones are sulfur, phosphorus, chlorine, iodine, and fluorine. fluorine. So anything that has sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, and iron also, but the top four are the main ones, are going to be alkaline forming. Now, in terms of foods, the acid forming ones are foods that are high <clears throat> in minerals and vitamins. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, so foods that are high in calcium, uh, potassium, sodium, sorry, and magnesium and iron, basically a vegetable-based diet. Foods that are high acid forming are foods high in protein, fat, and carbohydrates, foods high in sulfur, um, phosphorus, chlorine, and iodine, basically an animal-based diet. So that's the basic effect of foods. So vegetarians and vegans often pay little attention to acid alkaline theory because they think, well, I eat a lot of vegetables. So you need to be concerned about acid and alkaline um, because there are factors that can lead to too much acid um, besides just environmental factors and worry and all of those things, which we also said were acid forming. So too much sugar and sugary products. I see this especially in like Seventh-day Adventists. I've, we used to have, a lot of them come to the center in Oroville when we had the center and they would eat, a, they would, sure they were eating a lot of vegetables, but they were also eating a lot of sugar. Um, too much greens and beans to the exclusion of vegetables um, and exclusion of needed nutrients, um, EFAs being the most essential fatty acids. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, alkaline forming foods we want to look at. So the strong alkaline forming foods are sea vegetables, pickles, we're talking about natural pickles like nuka pickles, um, um, sea salt, miso, umeboshi, um, you, soy sauce would be there too. Uh, moderates are vegetables and fruit with an asterisk. I'm gonna talk about fruit in a second. And weak ones are herbs and spices, sprouts from grains and beans, and some mineral waters are weak alkaline forming foods. So I wanna talk about fruits and potatoes for just a second. So uh, fruit is not alkaline forming for everyone all the time. 
this is important to understand. So it depends on the strength of the lungs because the fruits have what are called weak acids, like citric acid is a weak acid and a weak acid is processed by the lungs. So if your lungs are strong, um, you could take fruit. A lady at one of the lectures I did on acid and alkaline said that her mom had emphysema um, and was on all kinds of drugs and things for that. And, and um, she asked me and I said, well, probably should avoid fruit because the lungs are not real strong. Um, also, how much is eaten and how well it's processed by the body um, can overdo anything. And if you're sick, such as cancer, it's better to avoid fruits. That's the common macrobiotic um, theory on that. Now, potatoes are alkaline forming only if eaten with the skins. The nutrients on the alkaline minerals on the potatoes are right on the layer underneath the skin. So if you peel that off and don't eat it, you're getting only starch and starch is a carbohydrate and carbohydrate is acid forming. So potatoes without the skin. And then if you deep fry them like French fries, you make them even more acidic. But anyway, that's it on the side. Um, so the acid forming foods, the weak ones are whole grains, dried beans, nuts and seeds, dairy, which varies, uh, but for the most part dairy, um, and most tap waters. You'd have, to, you'd have to do a test on your tap water to see, but um, especially if they add fluoride. Uh, and raw oils, those are all weak acid forming foods. The moderate ones are the refined grains, fish and poultry, heated vegetable oils. So you see even people who are, well, people who are on vegan macrobiotic are basically, only getting weak acid forming foods and not the moderate ones for the most part, um, but some because of heated oils and refined grains and fish, if you eat fish. Um, strong ones are red meat, refined sugar, soft drinks, alcohol, chemicalized table salt. I put it over here because when they add stuff to table salt, the kind you buy in the store, um, they usually add iodine and they add anti-caking materials and they take out the vegetable, uh, the um, minerals. Actually, I have, the next, I have it in the next slide. So here's seawater is 96% water. The salt is 3.5%. And of that, you can see that chloride is 55%. Sodium is 30%, a little over 30%. And then you have sulfate and you have calcium, potassium, and magnesium, which are all what? Alkaline forming. So if you take all of that out, <laughs> and you just increase the percentage of chloride to sodium, if you can see. And then if they add iodine, they're adding another acid forming. So um, you always want to make sure and use a good quality sea salt. I highly recommend that. So uh, now I want to talk just about something I did in, in my book. In my book, basically what I did was I tried to come up with a scale between acid, it's represented by the C, and alkaline forming foods, which is recommended by the K. Um, so you go all the way from severely acid forming to extremely alkaline forming and I, I just made up words to, to make up this scale um, to make charts. So what I'm going to do is show you one of the charts from the book, which he this is the acid and alkaline of food groups in general. So there are some whole grains that are over on the alkaline side a little bit, but the X indicates the average. So this is the average and then the dotted lines indicate the scale of where they can go to. So they can go from essentially K1 to C5 in the whole grains. Refined grains are a little bit more acid forming. So we said before the sprouts take it over to more like a vegetable. So it puts it over more on the alkaline side. You can see fresh beans, that's green beans, are over on the 
I was going to say, but dried beans would be on the acidic side, vegetables, sea vegetables, pickles. Uh, pickles commercial that have vinegar and stuff are going to be on the acidic side. But naturally made pickles with sea salt, um, like I mentioned, nuca pickles, um, dill pickles if you make them. Um, sorry, I didn't realize. Okay, so fruits, like I say, it depends on the ability to process. They're basically alkaline forming, but they can be acid forming for some people. So nuts and seeds, herbs, you, you can read them as you see them. And then I, like I said, I put the sea salt. I probably put this a little too far over to the side, but I wanted to stress the fact that you need to eat sea salt. So um, going on, you could see fishes over here. Eggs are pretty much in the middle if you happen to include eggs in your diet, but um, poultry on the acidic side, dairy products, red meats, water, and then you see everything else gets further and further acidic acid forming. So that's um, basically an overview. So I wanna look at the further effects of foods. So alkaline foods, chewing whole grains. If you chew a whole grain like brown rice for 125 times, <laughs> and you're able to do that um, without anything else in it. You can't put carbohydrate, you can't put like vegetables in there with it or anything else you might put with grains. Just the brown rice by itself, chewed 125 times, we'll move it to the alkaline side. Okay, so amaranth, quinoa, and wild rice are your alkaline forming grains. So if you want an alkaline forming grain, amaranth and quinoa are good ones, plus wild rice. Sprouts, as we said before, fresh and organic vegetables, of course, are going to be over here. And soy products with the trypsin inhibitor removed. Trypsin is an enzyme in the pancreas. And um, if that, it inhibits your ability to process the food. And Soy products have um, this trypsin inhibitor and the processed ones, uh, miso, uh, soy that's changed into miso or soy sauce, um, tempeh are gonna be, have that removed. So they're alkaline forming, but soy milk is gonna be on the other side because it doesn't have the trypsin inhibitor removed. So acidifying is any flour product, refine you when you refine the grain. I mentioned millet because Herman's book puts millet as an alkaline forming, but it has a lot of silica in it. So it depends on your body's um, ability to process the silica. So it could be either acid or, I mean, alkaline or, acid forming for you. So pre-cooked, frozen, canned, chemicalized, added sugar, vinegar to vegetables, it's going to push it to the acidic side. So realize that, um, you know, probably less in the, say, the frozen um, or the canned, as long as they don't add anything to it. But if they chemicalize it, put sugar in it or use vinegar on it, it's going to move it to the acidifying side and GMOs are also acidifying. So I want to talk about alkaline water machines because when I was in Florida, um, well I was on the cruise and I did an acid alkaline lecture on the cruise and somebody said well what about alkaline water machines? So um, first I'll tell you a quick story. Um, when Herman, of course, wrote the book Acid and Alkaline. So people would, <clears throat> would send him their, al their alkaline water machines to um, have him evaluate them and give them a, an endorsement for their product. So he got this machine and we put the water in it, divided the water equally to acid water and alkaline water. And we said, wow, that's great. And I said, Herman, take the alkaline water and put it back in and see what happens. So we put the alkaline water back in and it divided it 50-50 between acid water and alkaline water. And I said, Herman, take the, 
take the alkaline water again and put it back in. And it divided it 50-50 again. So we sent it back and told them I can't recommend this product. So, but what was happening was water associates faster than it dissociates. So they divided the water into acid water and alkaline water, but then it changed, it, it associated back fast enough so that when we put it back in, it was already back to 50-50. So anyway, alkaline water machines are not necessary for optimum health. That's my opinion. Um, if, you, if you already have one, I can tell you how to use it properly. But um, these can cost from $4,000 to $6,000. And sellers make many questionable claims. And if you have one, it's best not to increase the pH greater than 8.0. That's what I would suggest. Um, so uh, what is a what is an alkaline water machine? Okay, Kangen water is one. Uh, okay. and here it is, and this is the one that the guy mentioned on the on the cruise, and I didn't know it at the time, so I researched it. I told him at the lecture, I said, there's no way they're coming up with alkaline water without adding sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, one or all four. So I researched it and what I found out is these machines, first off, they purify the water. So they do a good job of that, but so does Multipure and other less expensive water systems. Second, it performs electrolysis. Now what electrolysis is, is they, they chemically dissociate the water, and that, electronically, sorry, dissociate the water. But like I say, it associates faster than it dissociates and Stephen Lowry, a chemist from Simon Fraser University, basically um, he, he's totally, he says it's just totally uh, bad science. It doesn't work. The third thing they do is they add alkaline minerals. You get a packet of sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and you stick it in there to, and that's what makes the water alkaline. They cost thousands of dollars. And the better solution that I've found is you just put a pinch of sea salt in your water. That will alkalize the water. So again, we're worried, we're not worried about as much about whether something's acid and alkaline before it goes into the body. We're looking at the effect of it after it goes through the stomach, right? What it's what happens in the intestines is what's important. So even if you make water very alkaline, you're putting it into the stomach, which is very acidic, right? It's going to neutralize most of that anyway. So you need the ash to contain those alkaline minerals in order to make it alkaline when it comes out. I hope that's clear. So the effects of these alkaline claims, so true acid alkaline theory gets lumped in with these outlandish claims and greater skepticism and pushback from the medical establishment. So be wary of big claims for high press supplements and machines. The higher the cost, the more caution is needed. That's my opinion. Um, yeah, so, you know, basically what I can tell you is if, if you go to your doctor, um, next week and you say, I heard this guy and he said to eat more alkaline forming foods. The doctor's probably gonna say, oh, acid alkaline theory is bogus, it's bunk, you don't have to believe it. Don't believe it, you don't believe him. But if you go to your doctor and you say, I heard a guy last week tell me to eat more vegetables, he's gonna say, that's good advice. So that's, it's just how you present it. So the summary of the theory, acid and alkaline theory addresses the lack of minerals, vitamins, and phytonutrients missing from most modern diets. It's not about making pH more alkaline, but about neutra neutralizing excess acids. It's more about neutralizing the excess acids. If the nutrients aren't in balance, they aren't used effectively. So in conclusion, I wanna make this point very clear. Both acid and alkaline are needed. Obviously you need acids in the stomach to process foods. Otherwise you don't get any nutrition at all if you didn't have the 
the stomach acid. So you need both acid and alkaline. The body does better with slightly more alkaline than acid. So if you're getting more acid from the environment or more stress, you just increase your alkaline foods. So it's the proper balance daily that's needed for optimum health. Give your body what it needs and you'll be rewarded with health and happiness. So I'm gonna stop the share, um, this, um, yeah, the sharing there. Um, I see a question, where would carbonated water be, plain soda water? Um, it would depend on what's in it. The carbonation to me brings it a little toward the acidic side, but it depends on what's, um, you, you basically would have to measure it. It'd be very easy to measure it. You take some hydrion paper or what we used to call litmus paper back when I went to school. Um, it was litmus paper and they were blue and red. That's why I colored the book blue and red, but now they're used to- I wondered. Colors. Huh? Yeah, I wondered why. <laughs> yeah, now they, they've changed the colors, but anyway, um, but you can just take it, you put the strip in and then you just measure it against the thing and you can tell right away. So it's very easy to tell um, where, where it is. But um, again, it's like if you have, you take lemon, for example, that's, if you measure it, it's a, acidic. If you took lemon juice, squeeze some lemon juice out and stick the thing in, you're going to see it's acidic. But it's alkaline forming if your lungs are good because you're going to process the acidic acid out through the lungs. You're just going to breathe out. So an, another example of that is if you run, if you're a runner and you run, you produce lactic acid. So what happens if you run a long way for a hard, you know, hard enough for a long enough, you go, <sighs> and you see runners do that after the races in the Olympics, they're, they're a little better conditioned than most of us. So they don't have to do that as much, but they're, they're breathing out a lot to get rid of that excess lactic acid. So that's how they're getting rid of that. Um, so, um, so the qu another question I see, should I just go with these when I see them in the chat? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> breathing, how does breathing affect your pH? So basically, um, when you breathe out, you're breathing out carbon dioxide and out of the um, solution, if we remember back, there was a slide early in the thing which showed the, um, um, You, you get the HCO3, if you remember that one. And when you, you get CO2, which breathes out through the lungs. So basically breathing out makes, is more alkalizing. That's just because you're breathing out. And, and like I say, 20% uh, <clears throat> or 70% of the metallic wastes go out through the the breathing. So the breathing is most important. So if you do any practice like total breathing or um, I know that was big years ago when I first started was um, total breathing, um, breathing in deeply, um, make sure your um, diaphragm goes down to breathe. Uh, so um, yeah, all these things. Sorry, we're observed by Herman. How did he come up with these conclusions? Okay, so that's a good question. So basically, when I <clears throat> started and I was working with Herman, I wanted to do the same thing. How did Herman come up with all of this? Basically, the books Herman used were Guyton's Textbook of Medical Physiology, which is one. The other one he used was The Wisdom of the Body by Walter B. Cannon which is the second book. And both of those talk about acidity and alkalinity. And that's where he came up with a lot of this. Um, I, I had his book at one time, <clears throat> his uh, copy of the textbook of medical physiology. 
And so it had all the things that he highlighted and it was pretty amazing to see his highlights were just right on. They were just super correct as to, as to what the most important things were in there. So um, that's how he came up with a lot of them. Um, he um, looked at um, the ratio of, of foods like phosphorus and calcium. Um, so that those are some of the ways. And then some of it was, I think, just his intuition, his experience with it. Um, so, um, so Sean, the, the Swan Pitts experiment. So um, this is one that um, basically they gave 14 million millimoles per liter of acid to a dog. And they measured how much it affected his blood pH, the dog's blood pH. The pH of the dog, the difference was 36 millimoles per liter. So the question was, what happened to the other 13,999,964? millimoles per liter. They said, well, the dog took care of it. So therefore, the same thing would happen with humans. And therefore, we don't have to worry about taking, nobody's going to take 14 million milliliter, I mean, millimoles per liter of acid in. So if you take less than that, and the body can take care of it, then we don't have to worry about acid and alkaline. That was the conclusion of a lot of the, the theorists. And then other people said, but what was the effect on the dog? What did the, what happened to the dog to, in order to keep the blood pH where it needed to be? See, in order for the blood pH to change only 36 millimoles per liter, which is basically 7.4 to 7.1. That's basically what happened. Um, so that, um, so that's, um, that's what happened. So basically, I mean, they didn't study whether the dog wound up with osteoporosis or not. I would have been interested to find that out because with all that acid, it had to get some alkaline from somewhere in its body. So it took it from tissues and other places. There was probably a lot of effect on the dog. Um, but if, if you want to see that, uh, let me see if I can. Um, so I found that I'm going to. OK, so basically, let's see, how do I, maybe I hit return. There you go. Um, <clears throat> so I just put in the text, um, Terry Brandis's book on acid base, they, they don't use alkaline in medical things, they use base instead of alkaline. But anyway, acid base physiology. And that's where I found that about the Swan Pitts experiment. It's in there um, and he talks about that. But basically, if you really want to get into acid and alkaline, you can read that book because it's highly informative of um, the whole thing and from a medical perspective. So it gives, um, uh, you know, he has metabolic um, acidosis and respiratory acidosis. Metabolic would be affecting the kidneys. A acidic would be mentioning um, the other, um, the lungs, the respiratory is the lungs. So, um, yeah, the other thing I would mention is sometimes people ask me um, how, um, I'll get to the other question in just a minute. Um, so um, how can you tell if your diet is too acidic or too alkalinic? How, how do I tell if I need acid or alkaline? Well, one thing you can go by how you feel. If you're, if you're basically pretty healthy and all of a sudden you start feeling fatigue and dull mental awareness, you say, maybe I should eat more vegetables today. 
Um, that would be one thing. The other thing is I noticed that um, I have some, um, well, growth on my arm. It's basically like a mole on my arm, which my forearm, which came up. I mean, I, anyway, it's on there. I don't want to show it to you. It's, um, but anyway, it's, um, it's on there. So I go, well, what have I been doing? Well, Julia's working full time now. So I'm doing a lot of the cooking. And I like to cook grains and I like to eat grains and I don't cook very many vegetables. So, cause you know, it takes time to cut them and all that, I don't, you know. Anyway, um, I know you can buy them already cut for you at Trader Joe's, but I don't like to do that either. But anyway, um, so I noticed that I've been eating more whole grains and less vegetables. And now I have, this growth on my arm, which is coming out the skins, which means from the kidneys. And I go, so my thinking is, uh, I need to go back to eating more vegetables and less grains and see if that helps. Um, <clears throat> uh, so if I go on with the questions, uh, so do you think that the amount of whole cereals and beans on a macrobiotic diet could lead to serious illness? Um, not, well, not if someone is eating vegetables, sea salt, pickles, and sea vegetables, I don't think so. But if someone's not eating those things, um, you know, some people can't stand sea vegetables, they told me, <laughs> and they won't eat them. So that's one thing that they're not, not doing. Um, some people just use regular salt. That's another thing, um, you know. So it's it's a question of proportion. Serious illness, um, I kind of doubt it. I think the serious illness comes from the stronger acid forming foods over a period of time. And I don't think you have to worry about that if you just have it one time. If you're out in some social situation and somebody serves you, um, I, I don't know, it's a chicken or something and you have it, it's not gonna lead to a serious illness. It's what you do every day, you know, you can counter it. So it's, it's the daily thing that's important. The one timers are like, the only way it could hurt you is if you stress so much about it that you, you know, you create all this acid from all this stress and you go, oh, golly, I can't, can't do this. Um, another thing I forgot to mention is J Jim Moon, who's a, a PhD scientist, uh, <clears throat> he used to come to our camp many years ago and he did a lecture on acid and alkaline. So, and he was testing everybody, he had litmus paper and he was testing everybody's saliva and, and then he'd tell them, you know, what that meant. So he tested his saliva right before he lectured. And he said, I'm gonna test my saliva. And he pulled it out and he checked it. It was 7.0. And he said, 7.0, so I'm absolutely healthy. He gave the lecture, he finished, put the pH in his mouth, pulled it out and said, 5.0. <laughs> and he said, he said, that's the effect of stress. And my talking for, you know, an hour and a half, which lectures in those days were an hour and a half. So he was standing there lecturing for an hour and a half and he went from 7.0 to 5.0 in his, in his saliva. So, um, but anyway, the measuring the other end is more important than measuring the saliva because that's what goes in. You, know, you wanna measure what comes out. Okay, so, uh, I hope that answered that question enough. Um, so uh, let's see, has there been any thought about COVID and acidosis? Um, yes, from me, <laughs> but I don't know. In the media, there are a few people who've talked about diet um, in relation to COVID. Um, and, uh, I don't think that enough's been said about it, but yeah, I because COVID is 
affects what primarily? The lungs, right? So if you're affecting the lungs, what do you wanna do? You wanna make sure that you're alkalizing enough so that you're not overstressing the lungs as well. So if you're eating a lot of foods that are stressing the lungs and you get COVID, you got a worse situation in, than if you're, you keep yourself slightly eloquent. So, um, oh, what would be, uh, here's an interesting question. What would you say to be more serious, stress on a daily basis or some animal food? Um, I would say, um, if you're just talking about some animal food, yes, stress on a daily basis would be more acidifying than animal food once in a while. Um, the, the common thing I've heard any waxman in another um, session, I don't remember which one, said 10% animal foods. When you get above 10% animal foods, that's when you have problems. But if you keep animal foods below 10%, if you include them, he was saying if people include them, then um, the, you know, just keep it below 10%, you wouldn't have a problem. So I would say stre stress on a daily basis. Stress is more harmful than most people realize. It really affects you more than, and I can testify to that too. I've had more stress recently too. That might be why, <laughs> another reason for the skin problem that I have. So, um, so uh, oh, here's an interesting question. So moles are a sign of too much grain in the diet. Um, no, <laughs> I, I'm trying to just say that. Um, but I, I would say it was more um, not enough vegetables <laughs> was the other way. It was not enough alkaline. So um, it, any skin disorder, and I'm, I should base all of this on saying could be because there's a lot of acid alkaline is one part of health. Right, I mean, there's health is a broad field and acid alkaline is very one little part of it. So we can't say everything is gonna be, I mean, it could be something totally different <laughs> the reason that it came out. It may not be an acid alkaline thing at all, but I just, from what I know, things coming out the skin usually mean that the kidneys couldn't process everything. So it looks for another way out. Because what did I say? Metabolic waste 7% out the urine, 20% out the skin. So, and, and basically that's what the skin breathes, right? <laughs> that's why. Um, so your skin is breathing all the time. So, um, you know, Herman used, Herman used to say that, uh, like skin cancer would be too much sugar coming out the skin. So that's that's what what he said. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it's definitely moles or too much grain in the diet, but more too little vegetables, too little of the alkaline for me. Uh, so are there other other questions? Uh, yeah, eczema would be the same thing, or eczema, however you pronounce it, would, would be the same thing. If it's coming out the skin, there's a chance that it would be uh, acid coming out, acids coming out the skin. But like I say, there's a lot of other reasons. Uh, Should we desist from calling the skin the third kidney? <laughs> Very good. Very good. Uh, 
I, I don't know. You can call it what you want, but it basically, uh, it's an avenue. I see it as an avenue of things coming out. You put things in, things have to come out. That's the way life works. You put it in, it comes out. What you use some of it, the rest of it has to come out. If you have too much of one thing, it'll look for a place to come out. And the skin is a likely, likely place. Um, uh, so you wanted to discuss something if there's time. I think that was Swan Pitts. Uh, I think that was it. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, if if you do want to figure out. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't go into it, but there are ways to test, uh, basically test your urine. Uh, and my book goes into that. It has to do with when you test and how to determine the results. Um, so, uh, you know, it would be important to um, read it out of the book for, for that uh, or uh, yeah, but but I tend to I tend to just go by how I feel and what's going on and like I say the skin things or uh, you know basically when I start feeling more fatigue or more uh, dull mental awareness than usual I I start going oh because because what did Osawa say the first stage of sickness was fatigue, the first stage. So if you could catch any disease at that stage and correct it there, that's essentially what macrobiotics is trying to do is to get, get it when it first starts and correct it there and then it doesn't lead on to further disease. So uh, what's your all the way in serious in and what's, most medications are acid forming. I'm not going to say all because it depends on what's in the medication, but most of them tend to be acid forming. So I, I, um, I could tell you another one, uh, just my observation. Basically, so my one of my sons is really into metal music, metal, you know, headbanger music. You know, so that's acid forming to me. I listen to it and I go, I just, I can't stand it. You know, I mean, I have to leave the room. I can't, I have to get out of there. I, and it's very acid for me. But if I play classical music, he heads for the hills because that's acid forming to him. <laughs> Whereas the metal music is alkaline for me. For him. It's, it's based on how you process. So you, sometimes you can't say, something is one thing or another, it's based on your reaction to it. So that's, that's what important. Some people deal with things better than other people do. Uh, you know, um, the environmental things, it's, it's stress and the whole COVID thing. Uh, you know, uh, some people worry a lot about it. Some people don't worry so much about it and just go, it, you know, what do we know? That which has a beginning has an ending. So it began sometime. So it's going to end sometime. So I, I've got patience. <laughs> I just wait. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so I see we just hit 10 o'clock. I now have a clock. <laughs> Didn't have one before. Uh, but anyway, are there other questions or do you want to go on to the next thing? I don't know what the next thing is. Well then, Carl, I will thank you. You've blown me away once again. It oh. was an excellent presentation. You really know your stuff and you presented it really well. 
Thank and you. quick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> people could watch the recording, which I assume you're still recording because you have That's a right. <laughs> yes, I'm good. I'm ready now to stop. So yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you're you, welcome. Carl. You're welcome. I, hi, I would like also to thank you, Ginat and Carl and uh, all the other Thank speakers. you, Annalisa. Yeah, so thank you very much. to listen to all of you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, and I, I would like to thank everybody for your smiling faces because when you smile, that gives me more confidence. It's very alkaline forming for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> smile, so. Yes. So that's very nice. So I, I enjoy that. So thanks for keeping your cameras on. And, and, uh, thank so you. I can, so I can actually see. <laughs> that helps. It helps a lot. <laughs>